Good morning. Good to see everybody here, and what a blessing it is to gather again on the Lord's Day to worship Jesus. Amen? And if you're a guest with us here, we're, we're super glad you're here. Um, you all at Cedar Crest, you guys know we're all about wanting to make disciples of Jesus Christ here in the Lehigh Valley and among the nations, especially unreached people groups. And um, if you're here with us, joining us for the first time today, uh, we want to make it clear that that's what we're all about, and we'd love to get to know you, uh, get to know your story and where you stand with the Lord Jesus um, so right in front of uh, the pew, your pew there, you'll see a Connect card that you can fill out. You can take it outside these double doors to the Connect Center. Uh, and someone will be there to meet you, uh, to get to know you, and a gift that we have to give for you as well. Uh, so welcome, and welcome to uh, Cedar Crest. Uh, and then, brothers and sisters, we have an awesome opportunity next Sunday coming up. Um, our very own Haley Ott, who's a missionary to uh, the Chamani people in Bolivia, just got married. Uh, to Luis, and we will be celebrating them coming uh, back here to our church next Sunday. She's going to give an update uh, about her ministry um, and about what's going on with her and Luis and their steps forward. So be sure to be here for that. Afterwards, there's also going to be uh, a luncheon that you can come to uh, in the activity center um, at 11:30, where we'll um, celebrate her. Um, so so be sure to come out to that. Actually, it's just a reception. There's no lunch, I don't think, right? Uh, sorry, that's awkward, right? Anyway, can someone help me out here now? All right, I think it's just a reception, so that was, that was my fault. You can blame me for all of that. Um, and then a, a service um, opportunity, too. Uh, she needs a car. Um, so she's going to be coming back the 14th. She'll be here till August 28th. Um, so if you know anyone or if you yourself have a loaner vehicle that she um, could, could use, um, encourage you reach out to the church office uh, or to John LaRusso at jlarusso at cedarcrest.church. Um, and that would be a great way that you can serve them as they're here in the states and need transportation. And then lastly, before we have a quick update uh, through a video, I just wanted to share with you another outreach opportunity we have called the Good News Club. And these are after-school programs uh, that occur uh, twice a year on a, on a six-week basis on one day of the week. And many of these Allentown schools, Muhlenberg being one of them, which is about seven, eight minutes from this church, are asking for us as the church to bring volunteers there to run these after-school programs where we get to explicitly share the gospel of Jesus Christ with kids. How cool is that? And they run from about 3.15 to 5 o'clock. So I understand that won't work for a lot of people. But if you potentially have availability there or you know someone uh, here in this church that has availability, I encourage you, uh, after the service uh, at our promo table, Judy Hatfield, who's a member of our church here, uh, who's helping coordinate that, um, will be there to answer any questions you have about there, that. But this is an awesome opportunity to share Christ with kids in our communities that don't know him. So I just encourage you to think and pray about being involved in that. And now we'll hear a quick ministry update. Hi, I'm Troy Minerovic, I'm the Street Evangelism Coordinator at Cedar Crest BFC. I'm also on the local outreach team. Our mission is to create a culture of evangelism here at CCBFC. And what you're about to hear are testimonies from two of our street evangelism team members. And they're going to talk about how God has used street evangelism in their own lives. Hi, my name is Angelina Mancor. I am a member of Cedar Crest Bible Fellowship Church, and I'm also on the short-term mission committee. I have a heart and a passion for mission, um, and my dream job is to become a missionary counselor, and I figured this would be um, a step to going out there and sharing the gospel with people. God is showing me that um, this is a very important ministry and we need to be faithful in doing His work. My name is Nate Reimer. I'm a student at Muhlenberg College and I'm a member of the local outreach team here at Cedar Crest. During my times of street evangelism, God has taught me that it's not the words I say or how I present them or any illustrations that I use, but it's the Holy Spirit that um, is working in the conversation and softening the heart of the person I'm speaking to and uh, will eventually open their eyes to the gospel. I have seen the Lord um, work in the lives of people that I've met in street evangelism. Um, I've seen a lot of people open to having conversations. The youth, when I go out there, I, as a youth leader, I use um, being a youth leader to invite them to church and 
there are other kids that I've met, um, continue to pray for them by names. Um, it's like the Lord has engraved their names in my mind to constantly pray for them. Even though I'm not in co direct contact with them, I'm still praying for them. Sometimes I wonder, I'm like, where are these words coming from? Then I can't take credit for, for it. I can't say, oh, Angelina did this. All the glory goes to God because he's doing it. He's showing me like, I don't, you know, put your weakness aside, just be available and I'm gonna use you. One example of an opportunity I was presented with was one of my teammates shared with me that he was feeling uh, dissatisfied with life. Um, and I shared with him the satisfaction he can find in Christ. And just opening that door, um, it led to a 45 minute conversation with him about the gospel, um, where I, I showed him Romans 6.23 and how the wages of sin is death. Um, what he's earned through his sin is death. Uh, but there's a free gift available to him of grace through Christ. Um, and it is through Christ that he's able to start a relationship with God. And um, I would not have taken that opportunity if I hadn't practiced evangelism in the summer, in the planned times, um, and realized the Holy Spirit can move uh, in me and in the person I'm speaking to. If you are scared or hesitant about going out to do street evangelism, I just want to encourage you that um, a lot of us are. Um, it can be scary to go and talk to a stranger um, and share the gospel with them because you could be faced with hostility. Um, but I also want to encourage you that the message you're sharing is the gospel. Um, it's not how you present it or um, how eloquent you speak to the person, uh, but it's about the message itself. The gospel is the power of salvation. Um, so just trust in the message that you are sharing with those who, who do not know it. I totally agree with what Nate said in the video. When it comes to evangelism, many of us struggle with the fear of man. But with God's help, we can overcome that fear. Let me provide an illustration that I heard from evangelist Ray Comfort. Imagine that you're standing on the edge of a lake in the middle of January. The water is so cold that you would die of hypothermia within minutes if you were to take the plunge. How much money would somebody have to pay you to jump in? Now, now pretend your two-year-old son or daughter or your grandchild falls into that lake. I guarantee that you would jump in for free without any hesitation. What was it that caused you to instantly overcome your fear and take the plunge to save your child? The answer is love. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So if fear is holding you back from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others, Pray and ask God to give you an urgent love for the lost that is far greater than all of your fears. Whatever it is that you need to serve God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, ask him for it and he will equip you. Jesus says in John 15, 7 and 8, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I can't think of a better time in history to evangelize the lost than right now. Now is the time to put faith into action. Now is the time, today is the day to say, yes, Lord. If you're not doing so already, make yourself available to God and just watch what he does. If you'd like to attend an orientation meeting to learn more about street evangelism, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. You can also email us at outreach at cedarcrest.church or fill out the online form found under the Outreach tab on Cedar Crest's website. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to turn it over to Luke to lead us in praise and worship. Thank you, Troy. Uh, you can stand with us as we begin our time of praise and worship by reading from his word, letting God take the lead here. Psalm 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Some of us are walking in feeling that, and some of the, us are walking in feeling like we can't even see God, but why is he good? Why does the word tell us that he's good? For his steadfast love endures forever. Let's cling to that this morning. So give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his steadfast love endures forever. To him alone, to him who alone does great wonders. Would you say it with me? for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, despite what 
the world tells us, despite what our circumstances may tell us, you are good, Lord, and sometimes it is hard to cling to that, but your steadfast love endures forever. When we are weak, you are strong. When we would withdraw from you, you would draw near. And so, God, we pray this morning that you would meet us exactly where we are, whether it's the mountaintop or the, the valley low. God, that you would come and give us what we need. Lord, we need you. We come here to bless you and to receive your blessing. We do it by the power of your Spirit, in the name of your perfect Son, whose love has endured for us, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Who is the great King? Who is the great King of glory? Seated on high in the heavens, oh, Jesus, you alone. You are the Lord God Almighty, strong in compassion and mercy, oh, Jesus, you Search the world for a love that could fill my heart. Nothing compares to the wonder of who you are. So holy, holy, all the earth singing. Holy, all the angels cry. Holy. You set the stars. You set the stars in the heavens. You set the world into motion. Oh, Jesus, you shed your blood. You shed your blood for salvation. You broke the curse for our freedom. Oh, Jesus, you alone. <coughs> you rose from death with the morning. You'll come again in your glory. Jesus, you alone. Sing, oh, Jesus, you alone. Oh, oh, oh.
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold
Let's continue to worship our great God in prayer. Please join with me. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord God Almighty. Jesus, you are the Redeemer. Holy Spirit, you are the guide that points us to you. Thank you for being a God that created everything around us, even us by intimately breathing life into us and walking among us. Nothing compares to you. We may trick ourselves and give in to the lies of the devil that there are other things greater or better than you, but that simply isn't true. Many of us can testify that we've put our trust in other things, like people, admiration, money, and jobs, and they don't satisfy. Thank you for being the only one that can fill our heart with satisfaction. Lord, I pray we will be a people who find our joy, righteousness, and freedom in you. I pray that our lives would be wholly bound to Jesus. Galatians 2.20 tells us, and this applies to all believers, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord, we praise you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, I think of our homebound of the week, Ram Mihurin. Thank you for his godly life. Thank you that he is a man who knows all about your teaching, a man dedicated to you. I pray that he feels your presence with him today as he can't gather with us. We know that Jesus, you alone are all we need. So be with him today. I pray for the college student of the week, Sharon Von, Van Omren. 
Thank you for calling her your own child and adopting her into your family. I pray that as she furthers her studies on a college campus, that you help her to be a star in a time of midnight. Help her to shine brightly to those trapped in darkness around her. Let the gospel be displayed in all her life, her words, actions, and thoughts. Lord, help her to reach out to those around her on the college campus. Lord, I lift up Fernando, our outreach person of the week. Thank you for his faithfulness to your calling on his life. He obediently went to the K people to preach your good news to a group of people who have never heard about you. Continue to give him your grace and strength as he sharpens his language skills. Prepare hearts among the K people to hear your word and respond. Prepare fruitful relationships in the community where, Fer where Fernando will be living and working. Protect Fernando from attacks of the evil one. We know that suffering and persecution are part of the Christian life. Use these moments to draw Fernando near to you and reveal yourself mighty and strong. You have the power to rescue us from anything and carry us through any temptation and trial. Lord, there are many in our congregation hurting. There are some who are having surgery or recovering from surgery and it reminds us that our bodies are frail and perishable. Things go wrong. Help those who are facing health issues. Give them the strength to endure, the peace to draw near to you, and the grace to be a model to others. Protect the youth and leaders who are ministering at Twin Peaks Bible Camp. Draw new believers to yourself and help those who already believe to fall more in love with you. I pray for the discipleship on the trail trip and the men leaving on this hike tomorrow. Protect them and give them a sweet time of fellowship with each other and you. I also want to lift up Vacation Bible School. Lord, we've been blessed to have so many children sign up. Raise up the workers. I pray for all the planning, recruiting of volunteers, and details that need to be worked out before and during VBS. Open the eyes of the kids. Show the children their need for repentance and a savior. Help our church to love on the families coming into our building, some of whom may be coming into a church for the first time. Lord, you already know our needs, but we bring them before you knowing that for everyone who asks, receives, the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Lord, you are holy and we are not. Jesus overthrew the grave and conquered sin, something we could not do for ourselves. You paid the price we could never afford. So it is to you, triune God, that we say all glory evermore to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand again if you're able as we continue to sing. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we hear christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing his heavenly his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Let's go, Christ be magnified. Oh 
seated. Amen. Thank you, team. Good morning, everybody. So good to be back. So good. Thank the Lord. He has healed my wife and I. We did come down with COVID a week and a half ago. That was after being sick two weeks before that. So Either the Lord wanted me to rest or the devil's trying to take me out, maybe both. (laughs) The Lord's sovereign over all, though, isn't he? And we love him. We love him. Turn to 2 Timothy. We're going to jump back into 2 Timothy, and we're going to look at chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, and then we'll tackle the rest of chapter 3, probably a little bit of 4 next week. Paul writes to Timothy, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless his Word as we look into it. Father, we come before you. Thank you for the worship, the privilege it is to gather together as your people and to worship you and to make much of you, to make much of you, King Jesus, Lord of Lords. You are wonderful. You are great. You're awesome. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. You are the God man sitting at the right hand of God, even right now as I speak. 
And we love you, Master. We love you because you first loved us and came and dwelt, and died, took away our sins, rose again to give us eternal life, exalted back to where you are now, and poured out the Spirit upon your people. And we're grateful that he is with us and in us. And now we ask for your help, Holy Spirit. We want to hear from you. And we want to be changed and we want to be emboldened. I feel like that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to do for timid Timothy. And so come now. Help me, Lord. Help me, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. So grateful we have brothers that can preach the word and bring it, aren't you? We are blessed. I'm so blessed. I was blessed to listen to Pastor Adam last week. Bring us the Father and the Father's heart. You can't hear enough about the Father's heart, right? For us. He's completely for us. For his people. He loves to give good gifts according to his will and especially the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Praise God. Praise our Father. And now, as we shift gears back to 2 Timothy, and as I was pondering the message from two weeks ago that Pastor John gave from verses 1 through 9 about false teachers and evil people and then transitioning to what Paul is going to say to Timothy today, all my mind could grab a hold of was this, avoid these people and follow me. Avoid such people. It's the actual language that Paul used. And follow me. You have followed me, Timothy. Keep following me to be faithful. And I thought, how always relevant? How important is it for us to follow faithful people? It is super relevant, super important for us to continue in the faith and to keep the faith. This is one of God's good graces and means for us to remain as his people, and to remain solid. That is to latch on to faithful people like Timothy did the Apostle Paul. And as I was thinking about this, brothers and sisters, I was thinking about all the false teachers, the dangerous teachers that are out there today, and some of the teaching out there today that is cloaked as Christianity, but it is deceptive. I brought up a few preachers over the last couple of sermons, but then my mind went to another southern preacher that is very popular, and people love him because he's hip and cool, and he loves to try to say catchy things like this, Jesus broke the law for love. That's wrong. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. That's what he said. And this is the same guy that plants people in the congregation and are saved, already been baptized, but has commanded them to come forward so it'll entice other people to come forward so they'll be baptized and have his children color his picture in children's church. We have to be careful and discerning who we are following. I read a couple of quotes from so-called religious clergy about the two big issues of our day. Here's what one said about abortion. The Bible condones abortion. Quote, fighting for bodily autonomy is actually biblical. That our bodies are holy and the government should not intervene in that holiness. Biblical. I thought to myself, when does the Bible say that our bodies are holy when they are autonomous? I thought the Bible says we have been bought with a price. We are not our own. We are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord. Be careful what you are listening to, what you're hearing. The other big issue, one pastor said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
And that message is for all people, including LGBTQ, whatever else, individuals. Are we to love them? Yes, but that con- the verse in that context is about God's people. That's written for Christians who have been saved, no longer condemned. Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate the love of God for his people. Those people need to be saved and get into the salvation saving love of God. That's what they need. That's love. But then we take, we take a verse out of context and we use it to fit our narrative and our beliefs. You have to be discerning, brothers and sisters you got to be careful who you are following. That's the message for this morning. Paul is saying to Timothy, avoid such people, false teachers, wicked people. Avoid them and remember that you have been following me. Keep following me in order to stay faithful. But he's going to give this caveat. If you do that, the world is going to oppose you. The world is going to persecute you because, as he's going to say in this text, the world is only getting worse. That's what we find in the passage this morning. And so we're going to dive in here, and we're going to look at Paul telling Timothy, keep following me. You followed me. You followed me. Keep following following me. And I'm going to try to boil it down to three main things. I'm going to describe all of these. There's a lot of qualifiers in here, but there's three main ones that I see. Doctrine, living, and purpose. Doctrine, living, and purpose. Timothy, latch on to someone who is known for godly doctrine. Timothy, latch on to somebody who is known for godly living. Timothy, latch on to somebody who lives for Christ. His purpose in life is to live for Christ. And so here we go, verse 10. You, Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Whew. You have followed you, Timothy. This is like an attention grabber. That's what Paul's doing. He, wake up, man, if you haven't been hearing what I've been saying here. He wants Timothy's full attention. You, Timothy, you, however, not like the false teachers, you have followed me. They haven't. And what does he say? You followed my teaching and my conduct. The word follow, I love that word follow. It means to follow really, 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 really carefully and closely. It's the same word that was used for the doctor, for Dr. Luke in the beginning of Luke 1. Do you remember him? Oh, I have followed all things closely. Many things are written about the Lord Jesus Christ, but I have carefully investigated Theophilus so that you may be certain I have followed all things closely, carefully. And that makes sense. Timothy followed Paul very carefully for 10 whole years at this point. Watching, listening. I love that. And I thought to myself, wow, could you imagine that mentorship program? Whoa, Paul, besides the Lord Jesus Christ being the greatest mentor this world's ever seen for the 12 disciples, I thought he'd be my next choice. The apostle Paul, this had to have a massive impact on Timothy, right? Massive impact is he followed Paul so closely. I could hear, here's here's Timothy, my mentor said, right? You, You find yourself doing that? You got a mentor, you got a godly person in your life. My mentor said, My mentor did. (laughs) I bet that was Timothy. Brothers and sisters, when I think about this, I think to myself how important it is to have a Paul in my life. 
so important to have a Paul in my life. I've had many Pauls in my life. I've looked for mentors. I've had mentors. I'm looking for another mentor now that I moved to this area, even though I talked to all kinds of brothers in the BFC, and I got brothers here that mentor me as well. Actually, one brother in the BFC reached out to me and wanted mentoring and preaching, and honestly, I'm being mentored by him too. But it's so important to have godly people in your life. Do you have a mentor? Do you have a godly person in your life that you are clinging to for dear life, watching, listening to? Somebody who, first of all, is known for their sound teaching. They're known for their sound teaching or their sound doctrine. Paul's going to, he's going to list all kinds of things. Nine things he, here he's going to list. Seven things he brings up in verse 10. He's going to bring up two more in verse 11. But like I said, I'm going to boil these down mainly. I'm going to describe them all briefly. But then I thought, could I say this too? Flipping this around, could I say this? Could you say this to somebody in your life? Follow me. You followed me. This is important. Yes, you want to look for a mentor to follow, but on the flip side of that, you should be able to say, after you matured into faith, you have followed me. Can I say that? I pray I can say that. I've mentored many people. I hope I could say that and still say that. I hope I can say that all the way to my grave. You followed me. You followed my teaching. You followed my conduct. So the first one, a godly example is known for his sound teaching. That's why he says to Timothy, you have followed my teaching. Can you imagine Timothy sitting at the feet of the apostle Paul? Oh, I bet the Lord gave him a heart to just want to sit there and listen, cling to, hang on every word. Have you ever had anybody in your life, you just, give me more Teach me. I am all ears. I am listening. You ever have anybody in your life like that? Find one if you don't have one that will teach you the Word of God. I mean, Timothy just latched on. Did you know that Timothy, not just listening, but writing as well. Did you know that Timothy was a part of of the letters that Paul wrote? He was a co-author with some of the letters. He actually sent some of the letters So you better believe Timothy was really, really familiar with Paul's teaching. I wonder if people heard Timothy and they said, I hear Paul. I hear Paul. That's what Paul said. Now, yes, he would have known that Paul was a unique apostle. He was inspired by God to preach and teach the very words of God and write them down. Paul's going to tell us next week, we're going to hit this, that all Scripture is God-breathed. So latch on to somebody who knows God's Word, who loves God's Word, who loves to teach God's Word, and follow them, follow them. And then I thought to myself, he brings teaching up first. He brings it up first. It's so important, isn't it? Teaching God's Word is so important. Next week, we're going to get into the Word of God. And Paul's going to say, oh, Timothy, you have been familiar with the Word of God from infancy. And it was this Word of God that made you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It was the Word of God that led to your salvation. It was the Word of God that makes a man competent, ready for every good work. Right? You know those verses. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God that leads to salvation. It's the Word of God that leads to people's sanctification. That's what Jesus said, O Father, in His high priestly prayer. Sanctify them by the Word, the truth. Thy Word is truth. As we're going to hear next week, Paul says to Timothy, that's why you preach the Word. Teaching. So important, so important, so important. And oh God, help us to rightly handle this word and to teach this word and for all of us to cling to people who teach the word in order to stay faithful. Now it's not just teaching, 
Next, he says, you have watched my life and conduct. You've watched my life and my conduct. This means his way of life. You followed my way of living very closely. You've watched. You've watched how I live, how I conducted myself in the words that I used, in the responses that I gave. You observed very carefully, yes, my preaching, but also how I conducted myself when I was defending the faith. You've seen how I lived a holy life. You've You've seen my prayer life. You're aware of my prayer life. You're familiar with my service. All of it. All of it. Timothy knew. He knew it. Do you know somebody that well? This means that Timothy spent time with this. He spent time with Paul. He knew his teaching. He knew his way of life. Do you have somebody in your life that you know that closely. You know their teaching. You know the way they live. And they back it up. They back it up. Could you ever imagine Paul saying, you know, do what I say, but don't do what I do? You ever ima- could you imagine Paul saying that? I think Paul would say, that's not Christian Do what I say and do what I do. That's Christian. Somebody said this. How does Paul relate to his family, his friends, his fellow workers, even strangers? Is he rude or sensitive? Oblivious to the needs of others or kind and caring? Christianity is a way of life that affects all of life. It's a way of life that affects all of life. Amen. That's why I I pray and I try to live up to what my wife sometimes, or at one time posted on Facebook. I told you before, I stalk sometimes through her Facebook, but she said one, at one point, she said, the man you see in the pulpit is the same man at home. I pray, I pray that that remains true. That doesn't mean I don't blow it, just ask her. But I want to be the same man all the time. Firm in doctrine, firm in living out my doctrine. Next. He says, you followed my purpose in life. You see? See the text? You followed my aim in life. My aim, my goals. This is what I hear. My goals in life. My purpose for living. And you know the Apostle Paul. I don't know anybody who is as single-minded as the Apostle Paul. All he thought about was Jesus. All he talked about was Jesus. All he talked about doing was kingdom work. He was so about Jesus. I got that plaque above my my door at home. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Anybody hear that phrase? I should just put Paul. (laughs) It was Paul. I mean, think about the things Paul said. He made it his ambition to please the Lord in his life, in his preaching, in his planting churches, in his living. It's my ambition to please the Lord. It was his ambition to preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel, he said. And he said in the book of Acts, I don't count my life as worth anything unless I fulfill the calling and the purpose that the Lord has given to me to preach the gospel of his grace. Those were the purposes that Paul had I want to preach where Christ hasn't been named before. That was his purpose in life, his goal, his aim. And I'm grateful we reflect that, Brother John. Unreached people groups, we want to take Jesus to them. Purpose. Purpose. Grab a hold of somebody that's single-minded. I thought of this illustration. I need these kinds of people too to keep me fired up in the faith, don't you? I thought of this illustration, like sometimes I can feel a little bit uh, cool, 
Anybody else feel cool? Oh, hum, lukewarm? Like a piece of wood that's sitting beside the fire? Throw me in the fire. Throw me in the fire where all the other brothers and sisters are burning for the Lord, so I burn. That's how it works as well. This is why I said one of God's good graces means that he gives to us as other believers to be around. That's why Paul's encouraging Timothy, you followed me, you followed me, you followed me. He's trying to encourage them, keep following me. You know, you know how I preached, you know my teaching, you know how I lived, you know my purposes, Timothy. Timothy needed this, brothers and sisters. He needed this. He might have been feeling weak right now. He's facing false teachers. He's probably getting pummeled. And what strength that he can get when his mentor comes along. He says, hey, man, you remember my teaching? You remember my preaching? You remember how I lived? I think that would strengthen him. That's why I need people in my life, people that I know that are solid. I need to listen. Go on the Internet, listen to certain people. Hang out with brother pastors a little bit more. Find people who are loving Christ and latch on. God uses that to stoke the fire and the flame within yourself to remain faithful. Do you have somebody in your life like that? I hope you do. I hope you do. Now, he's going to go through here, and I'm just going to briefly talk about some of these other qualifications, qualifiers that he gives. Next, he says, you, you followed my faith. You followed my faith. My faith. That's not rocket science. His faith, his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his promises. Paul was a convicted man. Paul was a certain man. He knew the gospel. He clung to the gospel. He knew the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't find any person more convicted than the Apostle Paul of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust him. I trust his word. I trust his promises. That's faith. Faith is the assurance. Where does this come from? You know, book of Hebrews. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the promises of God that we haven't received yet. Oh, Paul, Paul had that hope. Faith is the conviction of things unseen. Spirit, we don't see Christ, but we know they're real. You followed my faith, Timothy. Next he says, my patience, my patience. (sighs) It means to be long before anger arises. Does that describe you and me? It means Paul did not have a short fuse. He could deal with all kinds of people with such patience. I think of the kings that he stood before. Right? In the book of Acts, he was so patient with them when I would have blasted them. What's the matter with you? It wasn't done in the quarter. He did say that, but I would have said, Lord, you want me to call down fire like John and James? What's the matter with you people? But Paul was always patient, preaching the gospel, winning them to the gospel. Always patient. (sighs) Patient. Oh, patient. Love is patient. Love is patient. I pray for this kind of patience, for the patience of Christ all the time. It's the only way we can be patient with sinners and with each other. Amen? Patient with my wife. Patient with my kids. Patient on the highway. That's my greatest temptation, I think. And now, from preaching this, I'm going to picture the Apostle Paul behind a wheel. I bet, instead of telling someone off, he would be eager to tell somebody about Jesus or to pray for that person, to be patient. Oh, Lord, help me. Did you notice, too, these are fruits of the Spirit? So I think Paul is a man full of the Spirit. Patience, next he says love. 
We know that Paul was full of love for God, for Christ. I don't know of any other man that loved Jesus more than the Apostle Paul. To live as Christ, to die is gain. I can't wait. There's nothing. It's far better to be at home with the Lord. I want to be with Him. I love Him. I treasure Him. He loved God. He loved Christ. Find somebody who loves Jesus, who loves to be with Jesus, who loves to talk about Jesus. And he loved other people as well. He gave his life to other people, preaching, sacrificing, serving, giving generously. That was the Apostle Paul. Now I said in the beginning, we have to be careful because the world... The world is using even the love of Jesus, which isn't the love of Jesus, to chastise the rest of us for not loving. So one person defined love as this. It's seeking the highest good of the person loved. So, I just, on Facebook, I stalk in again. I saw somebody's post that said, when you die, God's not going to ask you about the two men down the street that are married. He's not going to ask you about the girl down the other way who had an abortion. He's going to ask you if you loved them. Now, he may ask us if we loved them. But the implication in this, and this wasn't posted by a godly person. They even said, I'm not religious, but this is right. Here's the implication. You just love and accept and tolerate. Because Jesus loved, accepted, and tolerated everybody. Brothers and sisters, that is not the fullest extent of gospel, biblical love. Loving, yes, is going to them, saying, I love you, but I want you to be reconciled to God because you're a sinner and you're in sin. And Jesus, out of his great love, came to die for those sins. Turn from those sins. Turn to him. That's love. That's biblical love. So again, you got to be careful. The world's deceived, and it's going to just keep getting more and more deceived and deceiving one another. That's what we're going to see at the end of this. Next, he says, steadfastness. Again, I don't know of anybody who was more steadfast. This means to endure great and difficult circumstances. Think of the Apostle Paul and what he endured, right? This comes from 2 Corinthians. I have received beatings that often left me near dead. Five times I received from the hands of the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times beaten with rods. Three times shipwrecked. (laughs) I could go on and on, the Apostle Paul. And yet he remained steadfast. He clung to Christ. He clung to Christ. He remained steadfast in the faith when a lot of people would have run. Not not Paul. Not Paul. He knew this was the purpose for him, but he endured. He endured all the way to the end. All the way to the end. I don't know of anybody else who suffered like this man. Hunger, he said, thirst, in danger from bandits, my own countrymen, sleepless nights. And yet he remained steadfast to Jesus. And yet he'd be the first one, I bet, to tell us that's because Jesus was steadfast to me. I remained steadfast because Jesus had a hold of my life. So, Lord, help us to have endurance, perseverance, no matter what comes. Now, this is probably why he goes into persecutions next. He goes into his own persecutions, and then the fact that faithful Christians, if they're living a faithful life, will suffer some kind of opposition at some point in their life. That's in verse 12. But look at verse 11. 
Look at verse 11. Paul's going on, continuing on from verse 10. When he says to Timothy, you followed, you followed my persecutions and my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, which persecution I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Now, Timothy would have known. He would have known all kinds of persecutions that the Apostle Paul endured. But Paul, he brings up three specific ones, and I think it's because Timothy was from that area. And so Timothy either personally witnessed or heard, maybe his countrymen talk about the persecutions of the Apostle Paul. Actually comes from the events in Acts 13 and 14. You might remember reading some of these where the Lystrans, where Timothy was from, stoned Paul, drug him outside of the city and left him for dead. You remember that? Those were Timothy's people. And yet Paul says next, persecutions, I endured. I endured, Timothy. You know this. I endured these persecutions. I endured. You know what I thought of, you Marvel fans? I heard Captain America. I could do this all day. That's what I see the Apostle Paul having the power of God upon him. He goes on to say, the Lord rescued me from them all. All. Now, what does that mean? He's sitting in prison right now. He's about to get executed. So, what do you mean here, Paul? He rescued you from all of them. Now, he did. He did rescue him physically from from that beating, left for dead, this is incredible. The next day the disciples came, got him, raised him up, and then he went to the next town, and he started preaching again. I thought, that had, that's the Lord's healing. But I also think that if the Lord doesn't heal us in this life, he will rescue us by taking us home. He will rescue us all the time, every time. Paul's going to say, In the next chapter, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. The Lord will always rescue me. Brothers and sisters, he's promised that for all of us. He will rescue us somehow, some way. He may rescue us from physical persecution. He may heal us. He may raise us up. Or he may take us home. In every way, he will rescue. Praise him. You win. You win. It's guaranteed. He's so faithful. Now, always remember this, though. Somebody summed it up like this. The Lord always delivered Paul in trials, but not always from his trials. This doesn't mean we might not suffer trials. It means the Lord will deliver us in those trials in some way. He will deliver us. He will rescue us. Man, I'm running out of time. I had three weeks worth of sermons. <laughs> Moving on, verse 12. Paul's going to move from his persecutions and say every faithful believer, if they are living faithfully, will, will, will suffer opposition. To some degree. Look at what he says in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. They will be. Remember Jesus. He's already told us this. He said to the disciples, if the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Because they do not know him who sent me. Brothers and sisters, Jesus came into a world that was sinful, wicked, loved darkness, loved sin. Not God. 
Praise God, he did a work in his people to draw people to himself and save them. But unless he does that, the world will hate Jesus. They will hate his message. They will hate the message of repentance from your sin, turning from your old lifestyle, the things you just love and adore, and follow God in obedience and submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. The world hates it. The world hates it. And we should not be surprised. We should not be surprised by this. And if we get opposition, we should not be surprised. And you know what I find interesting in this text? There's a couple of things that I find interesting. First of all, he says those who desire, he just doesn't say those who live a godly life, but those who desire to live a godly life. And then he goes on to say later later on, those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. I just wonder if he's trying to separate those that are uh, maybe maybe feeling church, churchianity with no commitment. People that go to church, but they're not really saved, blood, bought, born again, and go out there and live for Christ. They look like the world, talk like the world, fit in with the world, and they don't get any opposition at all. Versus the person who loves Jesus, desires to live a godly life. Not perfectly. We never will on this side of heaven. But those that are really striving, desiring, to love Jesus, to talk about Jesus, takes Jesus with them wherever they go, not just here on Sunday morning, but out there. All of those kind of people that desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. That means they talk about Jesus, not just God. You can talk about God. You might not get a whole lot of opposition, but would you bring up Jesus? Jesus, the only way, the only Savior, The only name under heaven which a man can be saved, you will get opposition. So, Lord, help us to live a godly life. And you know, it hasn't hit us quite yet. I don't, not like the rest of the world. New Testament times, he suffered physically. We we aren't suffering physically quite yet, thrown in prison, like people all over the world are. I don't know if you get Voice of the Martyr magazine, but you should. We got brothers and sisters that suffer persecution all the time. Now, we here in America, it's kind of been an anomaly. Most of the countries throughout the 2,000 years and generations have suffered. God has blessed this country. Praise Him. It's had an affinity for Christianity, but I think that is kind of sliding by the wayside, and it's going to get worse. So the persecution is going to come. Be ready, and don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. You're already feeling the heat heat on Facebook. Or maybe from your family or your co-workers. It's going to come. It's going to come. And I say that based on the last verse. Do you see the last verse in verse 13? Evil people, imposters, will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're deceived. You know the world's deceived. The things I hear being even cloaked with religious language about abortion and LGBTQ and all kinds of wicked, ungodly living, deceived, and they're deceiving others. we got to stand firm on the truth, and as we do, because people are going to get more deceived, their conduct's going to get worse and worse, we're going to get opposition, gang. We're going to see persecution. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when it comes. Now, we're not out looking for it. We want to live peaceably with all men. But at some point, if we are speaking Christ, standing up for righteous things like John the Baptist did, he got his head cut off because he told Herod, you can't have your brother's wife. He got his head cut off for that. So as we're standing up for our faith and standing up for Jesus, we're going to get some kind of opposition, which begs the question, if we never get any kind of opposition, are we striving to live a godly life? Ask yourself that. Actually, we're going to roll into we're going to roll into praying right now, and I think two things, two things. As I think about summarizing this text, we're going we're gonna to take a few minutes and pray. Think about two things. Do you 
have a Paul in your life. And if you do, just reflect on that. Maybe you've had Pauls in your life. Reflect on that and thank the Lord for it. What a gift. And remember their life because that will only energize your faith. So reflect on that. Did I have Pauls in my life? Who were they? What were their teaching? How about their living? And then ask the Lord, do I have Pauls in my life right now? Do I need to look for some Pauls in my life? Or can I be a Paul to somebody? Can I be a Paul to somebody? Because we all need our Pauls and Timothys, brothers and sisters. We all need them. That's the first thing. And then secondly, I want you to prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts. Because the more faithful we get, and I'm begging the Lord Jesus for more faithfulness, the more opposition we're going to get. And so let's ask the Lord to help us to give us courage, to give us boldness, to be ready for it and not be surprised by it. Amen? Let's take a few minutes. Let's just spend some time with our Lord on those two things. Jesus, Holy Spirit, <clears throat> I don't just want to pick on two particular sins. They're the big issues of the day. But many are deceived, and I was certainly deceived before you rescued me and saved me and opened my eyes to the truth. There are sinners all around us. To help us to have a heart of love, to go to them, to talk with them, to welcome them, but to call them to repentance and faith and reconciliation with their God. But Lord, we see in the scriptures many warnings from the Apostle Paul that there will be false teachers, there will be wicked people who teach wrong things who are deceived, even giving the appearance of godliness, whatever way that might be, yet it is not in line with your gospel. And so help us, Lord, help us to avoid those people and help us to latch on to the Pauls of the world. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Help us to find those people that love you, that love your word, that have sound doctrine, that have godly living, that have your kingdom as their goal in life. 
who exemplify faith and love and steadfastness and patience. Lord, help us to find those people and to follow them closely. And Lord, may we be those people as well. It's my first prayer. And secondly, Lord, help us to realize and understand that the world, the world will not love us. It did not love you. It hated you. So help us to not be surprised, Lord, when we suffer opposition and persecution, when we preach the gospel, when we desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. Paul says, you will be persecuted. And so, would you prepare our hearts, Lord, because the fear is just getting worse and worse, and it may lead to prison, it may lead to physical persecution here. It's already started with with a lot of verbal persecution, but help us to endure, help us to be steadfast, and help us to persevere. No matter what comes, may we honor you. May we love you, because we know that among the lost out there, we were once there, but you still have people out there that you're saving. So help us to remember that in the days to come. Thank you for your word, Lord, that guides us in every way. And we ask that you would conform us to it. Help us to be like you, Jesus, and live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And all of God's people said, amen. Love you. Have a great week. See you next week. Hi, my name is Pastor Jason Hoy. We're so glad you found us and watched the service online today. If you have any questions about the sermon or the church in general, please visit our website at cedarcrest.church or email info at cedarcrest.church. We would love to see you in person and get to know you better. Our services are every Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless.